Yeah, let's watch that. Okay. Go get us set. <laughs> We've had some discrepancies over what the best seating arrangement is, but I feel good with this one. You feel good? Yeah. Good, good. Thank you so much for having us here. Uh, it's such a pleasure for both of us to be back in this gorgeous city um, with so much um, just amazingly generous hospitality. Um, a few years ago, I came across this saying. It was probably, honestly, it was probably on Instagram, but it stuck with me, and it seemed fitting given the theme of transformation. And it was, change is inevitable, growth is optional. And I've known you now for, I think it's about a decade. Mm -hmm. And during that time, the thing that has, I think, most struck me about you is that when you're someone who doesn't have to, you opt for growth. And I've seen that in our personal interactions. I know that your attitudes, you're open to changing your attitudes about things like the role of the chef, which maybe we'll talk about. But of course, all of us have seen it in what you've done with Noma and taking this, this sort of kernel of an idea and bringing a lot of hard work, but also creativity and ambition and reimagining what cuisine from that part of the world can be. And we've seen you, as Mehmet said, uh, launch this symposium and soon to be school designed to help other chefs become leaders as well. We've seen you go on pop-ups to Japan and Sydney and Mexico, and then remake at the time when your restaurant is at the height of its renown to basically start over. So I wanted to start by asking you why? <laughs> what is it that through those changes has motivated you and made hmm. it possible for you to to sort of keep seeking out change hmm. i mean it's um but it's a difficult question to answer i think like if i if i if i think why noma became a success if we go back to that in the early days 2003 i was 25 years old I had been in a kitchen for 10 years since I was 15. Um, from that age on, I started working 80 hours a week. And truly, I was the worst student. I left ninth grade in dishonor. Um, I really did. I actually, one of my last memories of school was the teacher waking me up, and this, the room was empty, and I was sleeping. <laughs> Um, and uh, they actually told me to leave school. It was time to leave, and I didn't know what to do. So I, I ended up just falling into cooking because of a friend. And I, and, but then I fell in love with cooking, and I fell in love with, with the creativity of cooking. But even uh, if we go back to further, before that, I, I didn't know that I had a love for cooking. I only found out when I was going from what I call being a boy to actually understanding a little bit more of the world. I'm, I mean, I'm still a boy, but, um, you know, I was 15 years old. I was busy playing soccer and looking at girls and uh, doing things that boys do. I, I didn't care about food. I, at least I didn't think so. Uh, I knew that uh, there were things I didn't like, but I realized when I entered into cooking, I had these moments that were so pivotal to me. Like, in the first week, we had to do a competition. Mm -hmm. And uh, the teacher told us, uh, so you have to cook something, go together as a team, and uh, find a dish, cook it, and you'll be judged by the flavor and uh, how, it, how it looks. And when you're 15 years old, and suddenly you ask yourself, well, what do I like about cooking? And you know, it's just such a big moment, because I never thought about food just arrived, somebody cooked it. And sometimes it was delicious. Other times I didn't enjoy it so much. And it was like a real moment. I remember it vividly thinking, wow, am I growing up now? Asking myself questions like this. And then, of course, this, uh, this triggers something in you. What do you like about food? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, I started flicking through uh, books in the library. And there was this roast chicken. And, and the roast chicken for me is like one of the main treats I had as a child when my family was, uh, my family is of Albanian descent. Uh, I grew up partially in, 
old Yugoslavia in Macedonia in a small Albanian community. And, you know, when we'd had chicken, it was like a special thing. It was a, I connected very much to the person, the first speaker today, who talked about going to the post office and ringing. Because that's how we used to ring back to Denmark, you know? Going to the post office, waiting in line. Um, and getting meat was almost a similar thing. Somebody, a family member, had to knock on the big gate and you'd open up and they'd be like, Wow, wow, we, I guess we're going to have family or friends today. And then you'd chop a head of a chicken and you'd roast the chicken And it was just my favorite thing in the entire world, watching this getting plucked and seeing this bird, you know, roasting in the oven, rice underneath, all the juices dripping down. Uh, And when it came to the table, tearing off that thigh and the, the sound of the crackling and the steam. I mean, it's just one of the best things in the world. And um, and and so I'm there in Copenhagen in some shitty hotel restaurant school. And thinking about these moments, uh, and you realize, wow, you know, I, I love food. It is, uh, it is who I am. But at the same time, I also come from this family where my mother is Danish and a Christian, and my father is a Muslim and an immigrant. Uh, and uh, they took double jobs to survive and pay and send money back home uh, to, to the family in, um, in Macedonia. You know, we kind of grew up with very little things. And, uh, and really, the first thing I wanted to achieve was just to have a success. Like, because of this and my family, I just wanted to succeed with something. I didn't even care about anything Nordic or uh, uh, the transformation of a cook or uh, taking care of the planet. Or, I just wanted a fucking success. I wanted to prove myself. I wanted to do something for my family, for my family name. And I remember when I was 15 years old, I, th- I thought to myself, I don't even care if I'm going to die early. I'm going to do everything I can to make this thing become something. Okay, but you did that. And you and then, did it 10 and then, years ago. And then that's the thing that happens. And then you find yourself, and this dream happens to you, that you are able to transform your family or you're able to do something special and you achieve what was a dream and then what's next uh and so all the time these things change you can't say that there's always that one goal uh that at least that's not how it is for me it's a constant change of 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 thinking and and finding yourself who you are as a human and what you believe in your values they adopt and you become clever at, uh, you know, with with age. I mean, I'm only I'll be 42 soon, but but you know, I'm still a very very young man. Um, and so, with these successes, at first you're riding the wave of a success, and success is amazing. Like it's truly uh, incredible to ride that wave. It's like the, when people ask me how it is. Uh, it's like when you're on the airplane, and you you're on the runway and you go up. And you know you're going to keep going up. That's how it feels when a certain level of success starts. You achieve this thing, but you can still feel it's going up. You know that it's not ending. There's much more to come. And I had that feeling for so many years. Um, But at the same time, success is an incredibly limiting thing uh, creatively. Uh, And with success, there also comes this incredible opportunity. And uh, at the same time, we were riding on on this wave of success in the moment where information just exploded into the world. The the first speaker today, he said it so vividly, the way that information travels with lightning speed. I mean, we're sort of the product of that, in fact, that uh, we were able to just slide into this grit and and the wind took us. Uh, In a sense, we were lucky, too. You also have to have that timing and luck, and we struck that. Uh, And so... As soon as this success started, that's when everything also started to change as a person for me, you know. And the uh, next phase is you start having a family and you have kids and there's a wife and you're 25 years old when you start. And then suddenly there's a team of 100 people and some of them you work with for 10 years, for 15 years. You've seen some of them get married. You see some of them get divorced. You've seen some of them marry again and divorce again. <laughs> You've seen some of them have kids with three different uh, husbands and uh, wives. And 
you've seen some of them go into black holes and come up again as a as a stronger human. I mean, you've seen your sous chefs leave and open restaurants and be successful, and you realize that you actually do have a, a, a something to say, like a responsibility. It's it's up to you to make sure that you, that um, that these people they are you know uh, that they that this fire that's in everyone, that you're able to put enough fuel to it so that it becomes like a bonfire and they're ready to attack the world uh, with their mission, uh, with its problems, whatever it is, you know, that's up to me now to make sure that I, that, uh, that I do that. that. That's something that I, I wanted to ask you about because, of course, like one of the major transformations that we've seen, not just within the this profession, but I think really culturally, is the sort of changing role of the chef, where somebody who was basically considered paid labor at best, and was certainly never even seen in the dining room, in this lifespan of, really, in like the lifespan of a millennial, mm -hmm. has gone to being, you know, an environmental activist, and a thought leader who gets invited to Davos, for example, an artist who gets invited to contribute to leading contemporary arts fairs, um, you know, meetings with prime ministers, invitations to the White House, this is, and becoming spokespeople for any number of causes. And I, one of the things I've seen in, in you personally, I remember very soon after I met you, having a conversation with you, like, have you ever thought about like trying to become more of a public sort of intellectual. And at that point, you said, no, I'm really just more comfortable in the kitchen. And now you, of course, really embrace this role. Although there are plenty of people who say, no, the chef's role, the chef should just be in the kitchen. And I wonder how you respond now to that. I mean, first of all, I think uh, people really still trust cooks. I mean, uh, <laughs> honestly, like in relation to food and food issues, I mean, here are people that are in food. They are some of the lowest paid people in the entire planet. It doesn't matter if you're in Turkey or India or Denmark. I know that Denmark, we earn more than in Turkey, but we're still the lowest paid people. We do it because, well, a lot of us are really into it. And we try to understand it the best way that we can. I mean, we still have credibility in this. And I really think that's actually a very important factor. Sometimes you hear a politician and... You know, talk about food issues, and it feels like they just read a memo, and they have actually no connection to anything or anyone that's actually dealing with food. Um, so, I think people looking for trustworthy leaders that can actually say something that is uh, practical and useful, and that people can connect to. And I genuinely, genuinely believe that there are many, many cooks around the world that have so much to say and that have a vision for how to make uh, things better. And yes, I have embraced it more than I did when uh, 10 years ago when we had this conversation. And I actually remember we sitting in the lounge and you saying, I think you're going to work for the EU or UN uh, on food issues. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, I'm way, 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 way too single-minded to ever be a politician. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I mean, today... I think Noma has grown into this thing, and we've started this mad that's also grown into a thing. And uh, we want to make a difference. We want to make a difference. And, and I happen to believe that if we truly want to make a difference within the food system, we first have to fix ourselves, which is the restaurant trade, the people that work in it, uh, better work conditions, higher paychecks, um, you know, and all the other myriad of issues, I mean, gender equality and all these other things. There's so many things to tackle in what, uh, in an industry that not, not that long ago was one of the easiest industries to always find your way into. When Noma opened, we had uh, plenty of criminals working with us. There was not an uncommon thing. I mean, I've had several times people tell me, uh, Chef, I'm sorry, I'm gone for the next six months. I'm going to jail. <laughs> Sounds like a joke, but it was not that uncommon 16 years ago that, uh, you know, okay, you're a sort of a misfit of society. You have no place to be. Uh, can always find a kitchen. 
uh, and you know you find yourself in this pirate ship mentality and you belong suddenly somewhere and there's an angry head chef that tells you what to do and you're like okay uh, you know finally somebody's giving me direction um, but things have changed also in that field so much mm. a and um, and I am completely ready today to participate in making things better and I think we have to um, and, and I, I truly believe that this industry that we're all in, it's some of the most creative and passionate people uh, that I know of uh, because people work so much for so little and yet they still love it and they still want to do better and they still fight for that little bit of change, you know, and they can be inspired by fresh olives or, uh, oh, I smell this bread, you know, the fava beans today, they're so sweet, you know, it's, uh, I think this creativity and this passion if this gets organized and the, uh, the the sort of the the way of being working together and talking together with each other, the the how we can live as well, that you can find a way to work and live, uh, I think we're going to unleash so much incredible creativity into the food system mm -hmm. that is going to be changed forever. And I think changing it from within, from people like that's in here. That's going to be something really, really good. Okay, so I'm, we're going to open this up for questions from you guys. So be thinking about questions that you're interested in. But I want to just ask you one last one then, because we were talking before about, um, you know, there, how there's this hunger now for concrete actions, for, for people who want to make a difference, whether it's with regards to the climate crisis or with regards to making this industry a uh, more egalitarian and, and more just one. Um, you have a young cook in front of you asking mm -hmm. you what difference she can make. What is the action she can make to bring about real transformation? What's your advice to her? <sighs> Sorry. <I> mean, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's always this thing that we need, like, that one thing or that two things or that one quick thing. Every place is different. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have to just embrace that. We can't have the same solutions in Istanbul as we can in, in Copenhagen, you know. One thing that we can really start with, and that has to be 100% uh, clear, and I've been the worst at this, is, is talking better to each other. Like, 100% respect. Uh, that is uh, the number one thing to start with. And if you can have that to anyone, even though you disagree with opinions, we'll get very far with that. But, but um, that, that's still uh, quite difficult, you know. And um, I would also say, in the big picture of things, if you can, everyone can participate in change. And, and I know everyone is here. This conference is a statement towards this idea that food is undervalued. I connect it also very much to what you said because I believe the same, that food is so grossly undervalued. And the real cost of food, of a Snickers bar, of a gourmet meal, of a tomato, is just so under what it should be. If we were to have a system where everyone in the food sector, everyone in the food system, the farmer and everyone had to have a middle-class life standard with a house and a car and three kids and an annual vacation somewhere in Europe or America. I mean, what do you think food would cost? I mean, it would just be ridiculous, you know. And, uh, or not ridiculous, it would be real. Um, and and so, so I would also tell that person, remember when you go out and shop, think of that, you know. Great. Thank you. Um, I'd, we'd like to take questions from you. Please make sure that they are framed as questions, not statements. And please be as succinct as yeah, possible. Yeah, we ten letter questions <laughs> if we can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a, we have mics. You can also shout. Or just, yeah, just shout. <laughs> You're from Turkey. Yeah. <laughs> Only. Uh, big fan of Norma and yours. Uh, I've got actually, if you have a tree wish, you know, magic wand. And because of the, our concept is transformation, mm -hmm. you have a right to change three things. One for Turkey, one for the world, and one for yourself. What would you change? No pressure. <laughs> that was three questions, my friend. <laughs> you bastard. 
One for Turkey. Uh, very simply, for Turkey, I would say, uh, I wish that uh, Turkish food was as appreciated as uh, Japanese food. Um, what was the other question? <laughs> for the world. Um, you know what? I really wish that uh, we had a, uh, a big group of leaders that could actually really collaborate. Instead of not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me, well, I wish I started having kids when I was 20 because then I'd had more. <laughs> I have three, but it's, it's a lot. I don't want it. It's too late now. <laughs> President would love you. For There's that. a question right here. <laughs> Mama, this, uh, I'm not mentioning that. I'll still need to leave the country. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I do have a meditation practice. I actually do. 30 minutes of nadan meditation every morning, which is a part of a kung fu exercise that I do, kung fu and, and qigong. Uh, and uh, all managers at the restaurant have a meditation course paid for. And we have a meditation room. Uh. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to sound like I glorify Noma because we have lots of problems, you know? It's like... Uh, <laughs> Tons of millions of problems, but we're trying to solve them. And, and one of the ways uh, is uh, through, um, yeah, sitting down, closing your eyes, and having a, 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 some people like a mantra, other do breathing exercises, but it truly helps. Uh, other questions? Over here? Over here, yeah. Maybe you can shout, too. I <laughs> am. Uh, <laughs> the question was, any plans for a pop-up in Turkey? <sighs> I mean, um, you know, as I said, I've grown up with an Albanian uh, background. And when you grow up with an Albanian background, you eat a lot of Turkish food. Uh, so, of, of course, we have dreamt of this. Um, but, but it's many, 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 many years in, in the distant future. You know, when we do these pop-ups... We close our restaurant for almost six months where we have no revenue other than in the five, six weeks we're open. We travel with a team uh, of almost 100. Then everybody that's married can bring their spouse or their husband or whatever it is. Everybody has kids can bring their kids. We put them in school. We put them in kindergartens. We set them up in, in housing and transportation and dock. I mean, it is such a big operation that, um, yeah. <laughs> One more. Hello. Um, what did you leave with Noma, and what did you gain with Noma 2.0? So, what did I gain with Noma 2.0? I mean, I was saying earlier that you know success is is one of the most fantastic things, but it it is also an incredibly limiting thing. And how to best understand that is you have to envision that you have like a, a giant canvas the size of this and you can just throw paint on it and do whatever you want. And suddenly somebody says, oh, this is great. And then you're defined by that one thing or that thing that made it special. And, and suddenly over the years, you get more and more defined by it, not by your own will, but that's just what happens by press, by people, by that signature dish. And you're here, the frame is like this big. And so, for us, it was like a, 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 like trying to, to break out uh, of that uh, very, very comfortable couch that Noma had become. Uh, I'm sure the staff doesn't agree, but I mean that in a creative sense. Um, we were just sort of uh, shifting the same um, 
or painting with the same three colors in a, in a very, very sh small area. So I thought, what if we move the restaurant? You know, will, will something new happen? The story is a little longer because, you know, it's not just moving. Because as soon as we, we decided to move, which was six years ago, we decided, almost seven, that we decided to move. Um, and we sort of signed the deal even. I, I got nervous because I thought, what if we move to a new place and we just adapt the same routine? How, are we be, how will we be able to see fresh opportunity? You just move two kilometers away. Is there fresh opportunity? And, and for that reason, actually, that's why we started doing the pop-ups. Uh, the thinking here was, let's go somewhere very different where we know nothing. And will we go to, for instance, Japan, which was our first place? And can we go there and, uh, and see fresh things? Or will we just find a Japanese carrot to make the Noma carrot dish? And, and so in this discovery of a place, we also found a new inspiration and a new creativity. You know, uh, we always joke this, and it's just a very banal way of saying it, but, you know, the, the opportunities are always right in front of you. You just can't see them. And so making sure that you can see them better. Uh, we have these uh, creative uh, tricks, and one of them is moving a restaurant, <laughs> and another one is doing these pop-ups, and then there's a myriad of small other things. Another uh, One other of them is meditating. Um, as well, which I happen to do with the creative team uh, every day as well. The, the first oh, so what has, it, what has it given us? I'm not 100% sure, I mean, uh, yet, you know, uh, we're still opening up, we're still just building on to figure out who we are. I mean, I, I honestly, I still 100% are not 100% clear of what sort of cook I am or what sort of restaurant we are. It's still in, in process. I know that now, as before, that's one vision we have which is clear. Uh, and we're not there yet. I don't want it to sound glorified because we still have tons of problems with dealing with, with management and team. But today, our, our goal is not to be the best in the world as a restaurant. It's to be the best place to work in uh, as a restaurant. That's, that's our motivation. <laughs> One, I think Again, I just, I just want to say this, you know, this is not, it sounds glorified, I can say it here on stage, but we are 100 people that work together. I work with Italian men, you know what I mean? Um, it, it's just a mix of people, and in order to have the systems in place where, you know, your ideas and philosophies, they're com completely aligned, this is like an invisible grid that people work in and walk in on a daily basis, and people step over that line all the time. And, and it really takes a long time to actually hone in and be very, very, very good at it. And we are okay at it. I think we have time for one or one, one more, more question here. One more? Yeah. Oh, sorry, over here. <laughs> Thank you. It's lovely to have you here. Let me say that first. In regards to uh, climate change, Mm -hmm. How do you feel about it? What actions can the food community uh, take? And how do you see our near future in 10 years from now on in regards to climate change, of course, yeah. with all those diminishing uh, livelihood around us? Yeah. It's, you know what? It's incredibly complex. We discuss this all the time. We discuss it at MAD. Um, the, uh, the person from the UN that was here earlier, I've seen the reports. I read them. Um, you know, their recommendation is that everybody should stop eating, uh, not stop eating, but eat much less meat. That's the best thing you can do as an individual tomorrow uh, to help climate. But I don't have a clear vision or a clear idea about what the best thing is to do when it comes to food. Because it's incredibly confusing. It's a labyrinth and it's a, like a, a, a whirlwind of information that comes to you at all times. Um, you know, if I look at the energy sector, it seems more clear that fossil fuels will leave the, the conversation at a certain point, you know. How, what food is and all the complex scenarios of, I just don't know. I unfortunately do think that, uh, that um, 
we as a group of people that live on this planet together, we will only really change when it's almost too late. And then it's going to change. But we're going to wait until the very last end. And that's probably not in 10 years, I hope. <laughs> that's that's well, what I think, you know. Uh, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. But, um, yeah. Gemma, did you have... One other um, you asked my question that I was going to ask you, but I, to me it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible these things about, we, I was, we just had a giant meeting that lasted two days uh, on this topic and specialist on the field and one says this and the other says this, oh no, you shouldn't eat meat. The other says, oh, you should eat meat. Uh, we need the cows back and uh, they should just all be grazing and, uh, so, uh, you know, it, it I, I am in this a lot. I study this a lot, yet I, haven't ha I don't have a 100% clear vision what to do as, a, as an individual or as a restaurant on a daily basis. Except, I mean, I, I, I'll just insert here, because one of the things I think that has made Noma very interesting on this question from the beginning, even before MAD, but certainly with MAD and with Vilma, is that it was always very devoted to reconnecting the human with nature, right? Mm -hmm. And to like reminding chefs and cooks at, and ordinary home cooks as well yeah. of their, that they good do point. have a connection to yeah. nature. I mean, yeah, that's a good point. I don't mention this because it's, it's something that I, I guess so we just take so for granted for us at the restaurant. It's just connecting yourself to, um, to nature and, and everybody being uh, an ambassador for um, for for uh, for the natural world, it sounds. I mean, sometimes when I say these things, it also sounds a little bit too like sort of wishy-washy hippie uh, sm uh, talk, you know. Like uh, I'm living in Christiania and smoking weed all day and not actually doing uh, <laughs> practical things. But but in general, I I uh, we do believe, for instance, at Mad that uh, if we today uh, had every single child in Denmark have natural sciences also be uh, having be in in each season, tasting, smelling, seeing each season, the leaves, what grows, being in agriculture, these kids will inherently grow up uh, much more connected, much more willing to also take care of um, of the climate. That's some of the fights that we have that we do actually through MAD. That was going to be my question, you know, how <laughs> actually how from 2011, the first MAD, when it was planting thoughts, yeah. remember, to today, and I remember in the seven years, eight years in between, I remember you saying once when we met up in Copenhagen that, okay, great that we get gathered together, but how is this going to turn into action? Mm -hmm. And how do you see then the um, communities like MAD? Or hopefully at the idea. Mm -hmm. you know, how, 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 what is the power there? You've talked I mean, about uh, meeting, uh, putting people together is really, really something. I mean, before that, did, uh, did you guys meet like this? Well, already there, that's a change. Um, we've seen this at, at MAD. Monetizing this sort of change is almost impossible. But changing the value for food, <coughs> making it something that we, pr that we treasure and feel like it's worth and we treasure the people who are growing it for us. Um, that's something that we all are doing and should be doing. Um, and, and, and so in these sort of communities, that's when things really, really accelerate. You know, our mission, and when you talk about this, is that we're going to create a school yep. that's going to, we will, it's on, the, on, it's on phase two now, this. We just had a government grant, uh, believe it or not, um, to, to go into the next phase of the school. And this school is to build leaders of, uh, of the future. And, you know, c uh, entrepreneurial leaders, like people that want and has like this desire to, to, uh, to really change things, not just for, them, for themselves. Thank you all for some great questions and for having us here. And thank you, Renee. Thank you so much.